Hi, welcome to Jim B Live. I'm Rachel Horak. I'm staff at the American Society for Microbiology in the Education Department, and I support Jim B and undergraduate educators just like you. Today we have an excellent talk, and I'm so excited to talk about this because it's a really important topic these days. Our, the title of the paper that we're going to talk about today is From Novice to Expert, an assessment to measure strategies students implement while learning to read primary scientific literature. If you have questions today for our speaker, we'll have a long time for a Q&A at the end, uh, moderated by Jim B's Editor-in-Chief, Stanley Malloy. So without further ado, let's bring our speakers on, and uh, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Rachel. Maybe we could begin, we have four speakers today, maybe we could begin with each of you just giving a 30-second introduction to who you are and where you're from for the audience. Melissa, why don't you start and then pass it on? Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa McCartney. I am an assistant professor at Florida International University in the biology department. Um, and one of the, my research topics that I study is how we can get undergraduate students more engaged in reading primary scientific literature. Sarani? Yes. Um, my name is Sarone Foster. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at East Tennessee State University, as well as the interim director of undergraduate research. And so I'm interested in, in looking at how uh, I'm a researcher in cardiovascular disease, and so I'm interested in looking at how estrogen loss and aging affects cardiovascular disease. But then also I teach uh, large introductory uh freshman students, and so looking to see how they learn, and particularly reading scientific primary literature. Ming? Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ming Zhong from Auburn University. I'm working as a senior lecturer at the in the Department of Biological mm -hmm. Sciences. I um, have been teaching large classroom of introductory biology, marine biology, for many years. And uh, my interest is uh, um, the implementation of some high-impact practices in the undergraduate, especially freshman-level curriculum, and also some uh, um, challenging projects like primary literature reading and uh, also undergraduate research uh, to improve the students' retention rate. Nice to meet you all. And Miriam. And I'm Miriam Segura. Um, I am a professor of biology at the University of North Georgia. Um, I My research focuses on understanding how students read and analyze primary scientific literature and with those results, like using those results to better support students in this process. Wonderful. Why don't we start off now with a description of your presentation? Sure. So we... Uh... We, we were asked to speak about one paper today, but that one paper came from another paper and other papers have kind of sprung out of this paper. So we're going to talk about a couple different papers today. Um, and uh, the three, the four of us have been collaborating on this for a while. Um, this was one of our COVID projects that we all worked on. Um, so we're going to split it up into four parts and walk you through starting uh, at the very beginning with a study that uh, Miriam started. Um, all the way through to some additional work uh, that Min and Sarone um, and, and I have done. All right, on with the presentation. Okay, so um, like Melissa said, um, this project came out of other um, projects that we were working on before. And so um, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna start you off with a little background on the re previous research that really inspired this research and also generally why we should even be interested in this topic. So, you know, why is analysis of primary scientific literature or PSL important? Well, there's a large body of research um, that's behind these three points that I put on here, um, but and more, but I'll focus on these two three points. Um, we're interested in it because students who read PSL in the classroom have increases in critical thinking and data evaluation. They also understand better how science is done. And then reading PSL also increases student scientific literacy. So basically we're moving the needle on getting them to think like scientists a little more. And so I know for myself as a biology professor, um, if I'm training biologists, right, I'm going to want them to be able to think like scientists. So next slide. 
Um, I have a little, um, a couple little surveys here. So it's two questions, and I think Rachel's going to put those up soon, um, just to get a read of the audience. Do you use PSL in your classes? So yes or not yet. Um, and then how often do you use PSL in your classes? Every class, 75 to 99% of classes, half to 75% or 25 to 50%. And while you're voting, I'll apologize if I have a coughing fit, I am getting over a cold. <clears throat> so apologies if that happens. I'm gonna let people vote for a few more seconds because I see that they're working from the first to the second one. Okay, so um, it looks like most of you use PSL in your classes, which is great. It's awesome. And those of you who haven't yet, I hope this talk inspires you to. Um, and then how often it looks like one of, so hmm, people were shy about answering this one, but it looks like not every class, either half of the classes or a little more. All right, so hopefully um, this, um, seminar will be informative to you and in using PSL. Okay, so, <laughs> excuse me, see, I told you. Moving on to the next slide. Here's the background I was talking about of what's known about how students and faculty read um, scientific articles or, or PSL. So we know that if you were to give every one of us here the same paper, we could probably come to like a pretty good consensus of what are the important sections in the text. However, college students, not so much. They don't agree. Um, they also have a lot of difficulty with understanding the methods and the results sections, which if you've done this before in the classroom, you've probably noticed this. Um, and then probably because of this, undergraduates tend to place less value on methods and experimental resu results and their interpretation, which is an issue, right? Because when you read a paper, that's what you want to do and interpret those results. So knowing this and, and the experience with the experiences I'd had in my classes, my, um, so next slide, please. My research group and I <laughs> were interested in knowing why the students who we term novices read scientific articles differently from faculty who we termed experts. Um, and that's the question I'm gonna focus on here because we're not focusing on this study right today. Um, but we were also interested in things we can do to help students understand the text. Next slide. So here's a study. If you want to dig deep and know more about the results, you you know, this is the info, go look it up. It was published in, the, um, in 2019. So moving on, what did we do? So we basically, interview people, we did these interviews called think alouds, where we gave um, people the paper that's on the bottom right there, everyone read the same paper. Um, we had 11 students and six faculty, and then we interviewed each one of them separately. And we prompted them to read the paper aloud and not just read it, but explain their reasoning of what they were doing. Um, we also put in there some questions to sort of uh, prompt them to give us more data, right? More information. We recorded these sessions, we transcribed them, and then we did what's called qualitative analysis of these transcripts. And, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end. But basically what you do is you take these interviews, these transcripts, and you read chunks of text, and you try to assign to each chunk of text a descriptor, a name. And this descriptor is the code. So for example, underlining, taking notes, these kinds of things. And then you have these codes and then you organize them into broader categories that are called themes. Um, so next slide. That's what we did. And we came up with three themes. And um, for the purposes of our talk today, I'm only going to focus on the first one, which is thinking tools. So the things that our participants did, the tools they use to really be able to understand papers. Next slide. And so the tools that we saw in our study were rereading. If someone didn't understand something, they read it again. Some people read a chunk of text and then summarized what they read in their own words. Many people used um, prior knowledge they had to understand concepts in the paper. For example, students might say, oh, I learned this in intro to bio, that type of thing. Um, underlining information that they thought was important, taking notes, and then um, people, you know, many people did not know um, certain words in the paper. 
Some people relied on information that was provided to them to understand the paper. Others people look, other people looked up uh, words. And so next slide. What, um, so the reason I'm telling you about all this is because these were the thinking tools that were used in developing the assessment that we're really gonna focus on today. So with that, I will turn it over to Melissa. Okay, thank you. So for our research paper, we built off uh, what, what Miriam had started with her expert novice. And our first question was, can we take what Miriam found and turn it into an assessment tool so we can start to measure whether students in our own classes are, re are reading PSL and gaining skills that are pushing them more expert. So can we, can we measure how students are moving along that continuum from a novice to an expert? So um, we came together, we uh, worked with Miriam to turn her, uh, her findings into a set of basically Likert scale questions that we could give to students uh, in the form of an assessment. So we came up with 11 uh, different items to ask students. Um, the prompt was, when reading a piece of primary scientific literature, how often do you? And then these 11 items. Um, and again, it was a Likert scale. So with one being they, they never do that skill and one or five being they always do that skill. And here's how we collected data on our first round um, of validation. So we, we were working with, across three institutions, FIU, Auburn, and East Tennessee. We worked with the same uh, general bio inter one, bio one. Um, so these were mostly freshmen, mostly students who were very new to reading uh, primary literature. And we gave everyone in the course the pre-course survey. So we gave them all 11 items um, and asked them to score on a Likert scale how often they do that scale. FIU served as the control. So throughout the semester, they had no PSL assignments. It was just a straightforward bio one course. Whereas Auburn and East Tennessee, um, they focused in on reading PSL. So they had a class introduction and three homework assignments. And Min will get more into detail about this later. Um, and then what we did at the end of the semester is we again collected um, the survey using those 11 items and had students rank um, how often they, they use those skills when reading PSL. So, then what we did were some complicated statistics. Uh, we worked on this with our grad student, Sunny, who she's the first author on the paper. So I'm going to try and explain what she did as best I can. Um, we did factor analysis, which was taking our 11 items and seeing if they fell into um, separate factors. So it's likely that we weren't measuring 11 separate things. We were measuring maybe three or four separate things and several items were measuring each factor. So the first thing you do for this is EFA. Um, we did that, the table is in our appendix if anyone wants to go and look at it. Um, and EFA gives you the basic structure of, of your factors. Then you confirm that with what's called CFA. Um, this is a figure from our paper. And what Sunny found was that our 11 items were falling into three different factors. Um, and that's what's found here in table three from our paper. So usually with factor analysis, you lose some items. Some of the items we asked students just didn't fit into um, the structure um, of our assessment and it did, they didn't fit into a factor. And that's okay, that's normal. We expected that to happen. So we lost um, three items um, and here, here's what remained. So we have two items that are uh, measuring the factor of summarizing. So do the students read a chunk of text and either summarize it verbally or um, you know, write it a written summary? Uh, we also have a factor of, of writing notes. So are students writing down their thoughts? Are they writing down facts? Are they writing in the margins? What are they doing um, note-wise? And then the third factor is, we called it finding additional information. Sometimes I think about this though, is do they leave the text and go find something else? Like, do they look up a method they don't know? Do they look up a word they don't know? Do they leave PSL, learn something, and then come back and keep reading? Um, so those are the three general factors um, that summarize those expert novice skills that, that Miriam found. Um, and this is how we came up with our assessment to measure specifically um, our students gaining in any of these skills um, as they learn to read PSL. So that was our next question. Um, can we implement uh, PSL-based teaching modules that are going to help students gain these skills? And with that, I will turn it over to Min. 
Um, hello, uh, following Melissa's introduction, and also she had mentioned about the teaching module that has been implemented at Auburn University and the East Tennessee with the Florida International University as a control. I'm going to introduce um, how we implemented during the pandemic semesters. So the teaching module um, was designed in a similar pattern and the students were assigned with a paper, actually three pieces of primary literature to read prior to the class. And the class met online asynchronously and sometimes asynchronously at Auburn format via Zoom or HiFlix classroom, showing here at the top picture. So you can see most students are online, but I still open the classroom um, um, meeting um, regularly uh, to host this kind of high flex model or modality. And then um, since our teaching module was implemented during the pandemic, two semesters and pandemic, most students taking um, this class synchronous online, we use our learning management system uh, to deliver our outline assignments and also the online discussion board with the student assistant help. At Auburn, we use the learning assistant, the um, East Tennessee, and they use the teaching assistant to facilitate discussion towards the key objectives of this project of reading literature. Next slide, please. Have some uh, uh, animation in these slides. Yeah, so we implemented teaching module at both uh, universities using the same design. Uh, basically, the teaching module includes three pieces of primary literature um, with a blank PDF version used in the first semester and the annotated versions used the through um, the Science in Classroom website uh, for the second semester. Um, each followed by the outline assignment. Um, next, uh, click, please. So, and also the next. So the uh, outline assignment showing here, you can see um, we want them to be able to dissect the whole uh, primary literature section by section. And, um, um, and then reading quiz, and the next slide, please. Reading quiz has uh, uh, have been designed with eight questions with three content questions, basically test the student basic understanding concepts delivered uh, through each in each literature. For example, uh, what this person is, what the role of this cell, right? specific to the literature. And the five scientific literature or literacy questions, for example, um, we ask them, um, which of the following is the scientific evidence the, uh, well, discovered by um, the author of this study? Which of the following is the strength of this study in this research? So we, we, we ask them some skill-based uh, questions. And the next click to show you the science literacy question, what it look like, we ask five of these questions. And also, uh, so this is a basic and uh, kind of uh, um the the uh, uh, teaching module we deliver three pieces and each piece gave them uh, two um, practical assignments and uh, follow up in the follow up stage uh, we learned from our students that they have some challenges in the engagement or the motivation part in reading the scientific literature and they have some challenges to um, kind of dissect or identify what's the key point or takeaway of each sections in the outline assignments. So in the follow-up stage, we made some slight change of the teaching module by adding the literature zero, which is uh, the, the first one before the primary literature one, with the full lecture um, to teach students about how and why to read um, um, and kind, kind of the literature. And also we want to provide the students a connection to the nature of the science. And this last click to show you uh, connecting to the nature of the science um, slides. Yeah, primary literature zero with the objective lecture. So I'm uh, give you the screenshot about what the lecture look like. Basically we use the lecture to um, the literature zero to lecture the, all the uh, key objective we want the student to achieve and um, uh, give them example about uh, um, some key thing that we want uh, them uh, to take away after the reading of this. 
and also each section, section by section, about the key takeaway of uh, um, the literature zero. Okay, so then I will switch. Yeah, the next slides. Next slides to Melissa, right? I think no. this goes to Saron. Yes. Okay. So, yes. So now I'll talk about the data and the results that we have um, that we received. And so this is just to kind of remind you of the thinking tools and the questions that we asked the students. And so as Melissa mentioned before, students were given a pre-survey of these questions as well as in a post-survey and that what you see here are the questions after the statistical analysis or the factor analysis. And these are the item numbers that were actually selected along with the Likert scale. Um, so next slide. And so what you have here is the results, and this is table five in the paper, but what you see highlighted in gray are the changes that we saw in these particular groups. So if you can click once. And so for PSL2 for Auburn University, you can see that and with students being able to look up additional information, it was a decrease. If you can also click again, you can also see that for East Tennessee State University, it was also a decrease in students needing to look up information. And so possible reasons for this um, is that as mentioned, as men mentioned, the students were given these um, papers to read, but they also were giving the guided questions. And so one, students possibly, because they had these guided questions to show them how to read through the paper, they had taken notes on those papers. And so there probably wasn't a need to look up additional information. A second factor that we uh, that might align with this is that when the students, the students were actually giving papers that aligned with the course content. And so one of the papers that we gave the students was on cell division or P53. Well, the students were learning that information in class as well. So it's possible that a lot of the key terms in that particular paper aligned with the lessons in class. And so they didn't need to look up additional information. Um, you know, also, um, the third thing is that students possibly didn't connect that need to look up information as a behavior that went along with reading the primary scientific um, literature. Can you uh, I'll click again? However, uh, one of the differences that we did see uh, between the two institutions was the summarizing. And so students' ability to summarize what they were reading, we saw an increase between the pre and post test um, only at East Tennessee State University. And this is also uh, possible because one of the distinctions between the teaching method between Auburn University and East Tennessee State University um, was that in the first university in PSL2, students were given the PDF and they were reading the papers on their own. However, at PSL3, East Tennessee State University, uh, students were reading the papers, but they also were discussing their, their thoughts and discussing the paper in groups. They also had teaching assistants to assist or uh, facilitate rather um, in reading. And then we also were in Zoom, and so students were conversing and putting that information in the chat as well. So they had a robust interaction and in how they were discussing that information. And so possibly that need of summarizing or that behavior of summarizing increased or showed an increase in the post analysis because the students use that skill quite um, often in that class. And so this data is suggesting that uh, these behaviors and these skills that students are doing, one, having a teaching assistant or someone facilitating rather that group or that peer discussion is likely to be a positive or good behavior and that on-ramp of getting students into that expert-like category, as well as having some type of guided questions that we saw a decrease in looking up additional information. And that can be seen as a positive. Um, so by giving students these guided questions and how they read, can possibly help them better understand or how they're looking up additional, taking time to seek additional information. Next slide. So some additional studies that came from this work 
um, was now looking at primary scientific literature, but then also looking at those reading strategies to where um, students had annotations. So we gave them the PDF version, but now they also had annotated papers. And so we did use the uh, Science in the Classroom website by the AAAS that had a lot of these papers already annotated. And so students were able to uh, read these papers. And so again, we gave them the same uh, thinking tools assessment pre and post. And so I can, can you go to the next slide? And so one of the things that we found was uh, we asked the questions if students found the annotations to be helpful. And you can see that there was a large agreement of students did find uh, the annotations um, to be helpful. And we use a six point Likert scale um, and you can see the majority of the students found these to be helpful. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can click. And so the, the difference between this work is that we now wanted to do a qualitative assessment to being able to understand behavioral engagement of students reading the annotations. We did not see an overall change uh, in the annotations with the quantitative assessment, but what we did find is that when we gave the students or we asked the students questions, as you can see listed here, um, whether they use the annotations, identifying key information, or better understanding the text, how did they use those annotations? And you can see that there was a large amount or large percentage of students highlighted, uh, particularly in the orange circles here, um, of 49, 36% that they use the annotations to better understand the text. And then we did have some students who did not use the, the annotations at all. Uh, click, you can click on the next, yes. And so then we also asked some additional questions of, of how the annotations were helpful in terms of breaking up the text, distinguishing between the, the different sections, identifying key information, and so we see that the students largely uh, found those annotations to be helpful in both institutions um, and being able to identify key information and being able to better understand the text. And so the work here was an extension of their, of their reading skills or their reading strategies. And so now thinking that perhaps even using the annotations might be a tool that can be used to help students dissect um, and better understand what they're reading in the text. Next slide, please. And so again, uh, thinking about these tools and these assessments, here are some general conclusions that we have from all of these studies. You can click. And so one, that the PSL reading strategies assessment it is reliable and can be used as a validated diagnostic tool for science literacy. And so Melissa described that in the process in which we validated these tools early on in the, in the talk. Next point. Then we also noted that just reading the PDF alone does little to promote these strategies. And so what men described was the, the tools that we used in class to be able to further engage the students and to help them build those expert-like thinking strategies as well. Next point. And that we also saw and noted that the annotated papers, while we did not quantitatively see any differences between just reading a PDF alone, we did specifically see some strategies in the qualitative assessment. Next point, please. And so then we, we also show and we encourage that these annotated papers literally help students to be able to break down the primary scientific literature into more manageable pieces. And so this still may be a helpful tool in allowing students to build this conceptual framework um, and how they summarize and how they began to read primary scientific literature. And we also note that the students in this particular study were first year students. However, as we think about the progression and as, student build, as students build their knowledge skill set and become more comfortable with reading at the sophomore, either junior level, it would also be interesting to see how these strategies change longitudinally or how you look at how these strategies change in students from freshman to sophomore through senior year as well. And so this summarizes the talk. And so we thank you. And I think now we will open up 
um, the chat for questions. Uh, Dr. Malloy, you're muted. Thank you so much. You <laughs> Melissa, could you turn off the screen share now so we can yep. see our faces? Thanks. Um, I, so I, I just want to begin and say, I really like this paper. And it was really interesting to me because sometimes you don't think about way, the way you do it yourself. But if you look at the things that it says that experts do, look, I have little <laughs> notes there. I underlined, I outlined, and, uh, and it continues on every page. And I think and it also took me, it, one of the other things that you emphasize is that you go back and you read the section. So when you read the section where you eliminate a few of the questions, I went back and looked at those questions and said, that's really interesting how you did that. Um, so for me, where I am, I learn a lot more by doing that in a paper. And I can really see how the things that you're testing uh, have a big impact on doing that. I really enjoyed this paper a lot. Um, so we, I'm gonna. I have a number of questions for you here, but I, I want to begin with some of the, uh, with a few basic uh, kinds of things related to it. Uh, one of the things in this paper that's really interesting is that uh, your statistical analysis. Pretty sophisticated, I have to say. And it, when you read a paper and you run into those tough spots, there was a, a paragraph there where you were uh, describing your EFA, where I said, whoa, and, and I had to go back and learn more about it. <laughs> Could you just talk a, a little bit more about how th that statistical analysis that you did that narrowed down the questions and the sections was really very important? Um, it is not. Uh, level of st statistical analysis that a lot of people do every day. I wonder if one of you could say a little bit more about that analysis and how important it was for validating your results. Sure. So I, I can answer your question as best I can, but for full disclosure, um, Sunny Lee, who was the first author on the paper, she did all the statistics. Um, she's our statistics whiz. <laughs> um, but EFA, CFA, so our Usually when you design an assessment, you're coming from a, a framework, a theoretical framework that's been outlined and detailed previously in the literature. Ours was a little different um, because we came from Miriam's study, which was uh, her thematic analysis of her case studies. So we weren't really coming in with um, uh, you know, a, a theory that had been developed and tested over time. Um, and so we really needed the EFA, CFA to see what, what the factors were and what exactly we were measuring. Um, and it's my understanding EFA is exploratory factor analysis, which is your first round, which narrows it down um, into general factors. Um, and that is where we took out three of our uh, items that just that were not um, uh, connecting to any of the factors. Um, and then the confirmatory factor analysis just confirms your uh, exploratory factor analysis. And that's where we came up with the three themes, or sorry, the three factors. And if you look at our first factor, um, I think it's summarizing, there's only two items in there. That's unusual too. You usually have three, at least three to five items in a factor. But again, because our study was a little unusual, um, you know, as we were coming up just based off of Miriam's study, um, Sunny, she also did some extra statistics that are in our appendix to double check and just make sure that um, we could have two items in a factor. Thanks. Thanks very much. I think that that is really useful because the changing, I, I was surprised by some of the changes that the statistics told you were really important. And so that, that's a, a really key point. Yeah, we lost two items that I think most people do. One of them was uh, underlining. So that didn't fall into any of our factors, which is kind of a shame because it would have been nice to have that for students because that's definitely something that they would do. Um, but yeah. we, have, we followed the statistics, yeah. <laughs> One of the other things that you mentioned in the paper is that this analysis was initially done prior to specific training of students on PSL strategies, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was going to ask you about that, but it sounds like, Min, that you you had done that in your class. So I don't know if it had been done more broadly. Have you, have you really 
followed up on, on training students in PSL and reassessment at this stage of the game? Um, that's a good question. Thank you, uh, Stanley. Um, yes or, well, yes or no. Um, we, I at least did continue doing the um, PSL teaching module, the exact same thing after the project is done because we learned a lot from students. And we made a modification by giving them a very clear lecture. And we understand we understood that they might not have motivation, right? They might have these poor skills in reading this, reading that. And then we learned a lot about how to improve that. By but the we found that the outline assignment is really helpful to help students to really like. Uh, structure or restructure their thinking tool or their reading strategies in terms of this hard milestone. So we made a modification and we added the, the uh, very short primary literature zero with the full lecture. Um, and I got a good question that um, did we notice that some uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, critiquing scales when they read the literature, right? Um, we encouraged them to be critical, right? And the thinking or critical. And do you, we encourage them by delivering a few questions that do you think anything that the author can improve in this literature or in that literature? Anything that you want to suggest the authors or the scientific team from your perspective, right? And they did give us a lot of good things. And another follow up, right? I'm doing right now is um, developed a create, uh, let me. Uh, not a critical, but metacognitive assignment as a post um, kind of a assessment assignment for them to reflect on this hard task. Um, before the uh, teaching module, before the PSL, what do you think about the primary literature? And after this, you engage that is four pieces, right? Uh, for literature, what do you think about your confidence level in reading this? Okay, um, we may not expect you pretty interested in reading that, right? We might ask the wrong question. Are you motivated in reading that after the teaching module? Are you really interested in reading that? Well, we want to probably focus on, have you felt that you improved something? May you improve your learning gain, your skills in reading this, or your understanding about what science should be, what science is, right? Before or after or before. So yeah, we we did have some follow up, and I'm I'm doing that every semester. And um, but no part is uh, we didn't do at least my uh, from my um, uh, classroom I didn't uh, do the, the same pre and the post assessment anymore after this project is done but we did improve a lot about our teaching module and the Im uh, implementation part we are doing that now so, so one other question was that most of the data for this paper was collected during COVID when people were either in zoom or some semi-hybrid mode have you have you looked at this in an in-person format now to to see any differences from the kind of interaction students would have face to face versus on an electronic format? Daron, you want to go? Yes. So the annotated papers, so the PDF papers were done during COVID, but when we did the annotated papers, they were students were now back face were were also in face to face, um, and so we did not see any differences in the in the quantitative uh, with respect to that. But then also the modality, although the students were in COVID, and I think we can uh, know that they probably were under a different stressful conditions. We both still had that same. Um, peer-peer interaction. And so I know one of the questions in the chat I see was asking about peer interaction. Um, the students were able to still form groups during the chat or in breakout rooms during COVID to be able to communicate, use the chat function to discuss and summarize the paper in the very same fashion that they were um, in person. Um, and so although they were under different, I think, constraints in terms of their learning during COVID, a lot of the same type of behaviors or engagements that we did in person 
versus during COVID when we were online, we still tried to mimic those as best as possible between the two um, modalities of teaching. Thanks, Sean. And before we shift to the q and I just wanted uh, to make one more comment, and that is, Melissa, I understand when you were at AAAS, you worked a lot with the resource of science in the classroom. It seems to tie directly to this issue. And I, I want to make sure our audience is all aware of it. So maybe you could just comment on that real quickly. Sure. I dropped the link uh, in the chat a little while ago, but the annotated papers we use, uh, it is a resource uh, through AAAS. We have taken uh, science magazine articles and annotated them so they're a little easier to get through. So as students read, they can click on words and the vocabulary will pop up. A method section will open with more explanation on what's going on. If Sometimes it even links to a video showing the method uh, in real time. Uh, and it's just a way, hopefully, to kind of break down some of those barriers that students hit while they're reading to keep the student reading. Um, and a lot of the annotations do fit the expert skills that are in our assessment. So, um, you know, leaving the paper to read more information uh, for for an example. Um, but I, I put, I'll put it in the chat again, um, but it's freely available um, through AAAS. I think they have about 100 papers up there now. So it's likely that you'd be able to find one that works for your class. Thank you very much. Um, and now, before we shift to more questions, Rachel is going to give us a short poll. So Robert asked this question, capturing the pre-post changes with the qualitative analysis, did you also create a rubric to be consistent across the different institutions? So what we did our qualitative analysis. We took all the short answer questions together in a group and analyze them without knowing what institution they were from. Then when it was when we were done with analysis, we separated it back out um, into the, the two schools. So we don't have any individual rubrics. Um, uh, we, yeah, we, we did it all as a big group. It, it, I guess the second part of that, do you think that makes good sense given the differences in the population of students at the different institutions? Or do you think it would make more sense to have individual rubrics uh, for going forward versus for this. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I could argue that one either way. Um, I think the way we did it is a little more uh, anonymous. So we didn't, you know, we didn't have any biases of what school it was coming from or, mm -hmm. you know, what, what students they were. Um, and then the way we did too, you can compare the two groups. So you can mm -hmm. kind of compare apples to apples. Whereas I think if we did two different rubrics and had two different code books and two different sets of uh, mm -hmm. uh, bubble charts. I don't know if you could make direct comparisons the way we did. All right. But this follows into another question by Matura. And she asked if you had specific criteria to select the appropriate level of papers for the student uh, population other than content agreement with the course. So in terms of the, the criteria, so the criteria was set that the, it needed to be a science paper because we wanted to then have an annotated paper to, to align with it. So that was the first criteria that we selected, that they needed to be science papers. Um, the other criteria was simply choosing a paper that aligned with the content. And then we wanted to have some papers that align with one another. But no, that was simply a choice of um, aligning with content, but all the papers were at the same level because they were science articles um, from the same journal article. And then the annotated papers follow the same format as well. Can I jump in and, and just add in yeah. my practice, because I've used um, the annotations and non-annotated papers too. Um, I do the topic alignment and all that, but in my practice, I tend to choose shorter, and, and science articles are, tend to be short, but much shorter papers with less complex methods for the intro students. And then as they progress up through college, I will choose papers with more complicated methods. And if you look in the um, website for the annotated papers, some papers have much more extensive um, mm -hmm background in terms of methods, like Melissa mentioned, like videos of people actually doing the mm -hmm. methods. So 
you know, you can't, if you have the time to invest in and, and look to see the younger the student, the more background I would provide for them. And then the older, there's um, research out there that shows generally just in cognition that students that know a lot more and have progressed should not have that much scaffolding. So like pick the, you know, the more complicated papers for older students. So it's really interesting, Miriam, that you start with the science papers because they're the ones that have the least materials and methods. Yes. <laughs> and that, was, mm-hmm. that was one of the criteria that distinguished the novice from the expert in your earlier study. Yeah, yeah which is yeah, which is why the annotations, right? So the annotated version is so good because they do have that mm-hmm. background mm-hmm. in there. Yeah. So I yeah, I probably wouldn't choose a science paper without the annotations for the young students. Yeah. Um, have uh, two points that I add on. Um, I think Mary had al- always, co- I mean, al- already covered the most points that why we selected and how we selected paper. Uh, from my, uh, while implementing experience, there are two things. The first one, looking at, it's a short, yes, it had to be short, well-structured, and then short introduction, for example, short method. And for the results part, think about their variables. Uh, you might want to, choose some uh, research with less variables okay and with clear graph to so you can have a like um uh kind of better better well kind of easier time to explain that and the students are going to get easier to get it okay so that's a less variable control and in the in the in the research and also that research paper might be from the basic science and uh, might for, for us as instructor, it might be easier for us to connect to a bigger picture. For example, something that they have, they are testing drugs and then why, right? Why this bacteria is very important clinically and why we care about that. So, or you can also target the climate change. <laughs> this is a hot topic. So why do we care about this population of a lizard? And we use this paper. Well, why? I don't know why, but Think, think about the climate change, temperature, extreme weather, it's like those stuff. And then a yeah, student is going to love that too. So yeah, so, some add-on suggestion. Thank you. So Robert asked this question about what the role of the, the teaching and learning assistance was in this process. So yes, I can, I can answer that. Um, when we were online during COVID, their role was to just facilitate the the discussion in the breakout rooms. Um, And so students, as we mentioned, had a list of guided questions. They were required to read papers before class and have answers to those questions. And then in the breakout rooms, the teaching assistants were there or the graduate students were there to just facilitate a discussion, to ensure students were sharing and discussing their answers as well as communicating in the chat as well. When we came back in person, um, it was the same role that they served to uh, facilitate the discussion in the groups with the students. You know, one of the things that is really important is that all of our science students, in addition to being literate, uh, have good ethical concepts. And so I wonder if um, anyone has, has done primary scientific literature with an ethical component in it that might combine these two types of things to really give students the big picture of science. So one of the things that we did, and Min mentioned it somewhat in the, uh, I think briefly in the methods, that we did ask students a list of science literacy questions. Um, and one, and in that, those categories, one of those questions for each of the papers did sort of have an ethical component in terms of how would you use this data, or if this situation occurred, how would this information be applied to that particular situation? We have not analyzed the results of those questions yet um, to see if there were changes or differences Um between the three papers or either as student prog- students progressed along the semester or whether they read the annotated paper or the PDF papers. So that was a, a small scale, um, I think, intervention or small scale way of where we began to look to see how they did respond in terms of the science literacy or ethical portion of these papers. 
So, so, so John wrote something interesting in the chat. He said, sometimes I allow students to black box something if it is a particularly complex uh, issue in a particular <laughs> class. Um, so some of his students don't know a lot about chromatography, so he lets them draw HPLC as a, a black box labeled HPLC. Ah, what do you think of that idea? Hmm. Um, oh, go, Melissa. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, um, so my research group is doing, well, actually, with Melissa <laughs> as a collaborator, we're working on, um, a an extension of the work that I talked about briefly at the beginning um, with a different population of students. Um, and so one thing, because the initial work we did in a primarily undergraduate institution that's primarily white um, and now we're doing it at FIU, which is a completely different type of institution. And so we don't have, you know, we're still analyzing, let's just put it that way. But one thing we're seeing a lot of is students doing, some students doing this for themselves, like they will find a concept that trips them up and they're like, okay, this isn't important. Like, this doesn't seem to be important for me right now because I can get it from context. So they're like black boxing things on their own. So that might be a strategy that some students are using. Mm -hmm. and, um, my, my thoughts are every student is going to read PSL in their own way. And the more strategies you can teach them, one of them is going to stick and one of them is going to help you or help them. <laughs> so I think, yeah, if you have an idea, tell them. And if it works for them, they'll adopt it. Thanks. I was going to say, I think that if you draw that black box, that'll be something you can come back to and say, hey, I don't know anything about this. Maybe this is something I can learn more about. So versus mm -hmm. simply writing a note and forgetting about it. But anyway, um, so we're near the end here. I just want to say again, thanks so much. I, I think this was a really valuable and important contribution that will influence a lot of people bringing uh, PSL into the classroom. And I, I also wanted to point out that your paper was published in a special series of GMB called specifically on scientific literacy. So very, very important topic. And, and this is a great contribution to that topic. So thank you so much. And mm -hmm. yeah, I hope a lot more people read and, and think about this paper as we go forward. Thank you. I'm not going to turn this back. Thank you, to Rachel. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Oh, I learned so much today. Really appreciate our authors being here and sharing their time with us. Into the chat, I just put a link um, that you can go view the Jimby um, special collections, of which the Science Literacy is the 2023 special collection. Um, and then I also posted a link in the chat to view this recording um, probably in a week or so, and then all the past recordings of Jimby Live on our YouTube playlist. So go check it out. We're going to take a break over the summer and we'll come back for Jimby Live probably in August or September. So check your emails, check ASM socials for the announcements and do consider joining us for our upcoming webinar series. Um, called the Microbiology Teaching and Learning Community. And I'm just going to put the link there in the chat. It's really going to be exciting. It's all very timely topics and important to consider our assessments with our students. So it starts May 31st. Um, and the topic, the very first week is artificial intelligence, pedagogy and practice. And I think that AI will be a recurring theme through all of our um, webinars that um, for this seven part series. So do check it out, and we hope to see you in, at their future events. Take and care, thanks, everybody. Rachel, thank for you. all bye -bye. your support for the education community. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome.